On behalf of the Ivrit Bamerkaz, Hebrew at the Center, I want to welcome you to Sicha, a series of online conversations that we began just over a year ago focused on Hebrew. My name is Arnie Winchell, and I am founding president of the Ivrit Bamerkaz. Ivrit Bamerkaz was founded in 2007 with the mission to revolutionize the teaching and learning of Hebrew. We chose this focus in service of a vision of a world where Hebrew literacy is vibrant, celebrated, and pivotal to a thriving Jewish identity and global Jewish community. When we set out as a small group of Hebrew language educators and enthusiasts, We envisioned our contribution to this halom, this dream, would come through addressing what has been a lack of success in effectively giving the gift of proficiency to Hebrew, in Hebrew to Jews throughout the diaspora. We believe that through a deep investment in our educators, school leaders, and educational system to ensure effective and engaging Hebrew teaching and learning, we will see a Jewish world in which modern Hebrew is not only the language of the state of Israel, but also the language of Am Yisrael, the people of Israel. Our goal in launching Sicha last spring is to engage a wider audience in appreciating the value of investing in Hebrew and to join us in creating a movement to elevate the status of Hebrew. We will be holding additional Sichot conversations over the next couple of months. Tonight, we are privileged to welcome Shmuel Balatsky and Gilad Zuckerman in conversation. Shmuel, an old friend and colleague, is a professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Department of Judaic and Near Eastern Studies, where he served as chair and coordinated the Hebrew program. He also served as president of the National Association of Professors of Hebrew. In 2002, he established an annual pedagogical workshop for teachers of Hebrew. And that is how the two of us met. His research areas are phonology and morphology in general and of modern Hebrew in particular. 
Hebrew lexicography, application of linguistic methodology to the teaching of Hebrew as a foreign language, and building up language corpora and using them in linguistic research. Gilad Zuckerman is an Israeli-born language revivalist and linguist who works in contact linguistics, lexicology, and the study of language, culture, and identity. A prolific author of multiple books, book chapters, and articles, Professor Zuckerman has published in English, Hebrew, Italian, Yiddish, Spanish, German, Russian, Arabic, and Chinese. A mouthful, Gilad. <laughs> While his career has taken him from Israel to England, China, Singapore, Slovakia, the US, and beyond, Gilad is currently professor of linguistics and chair of endangered languages at the University of Adelaide in Australia, where he is coming to us from. He is, in, he is the president of the Australian Association for Jewish Studies. I now want to introduce the fellow that we're all looking at, Rabbi Andrew Ergetz, CEO of Hebrew at the Center, who has been moderating these, this series. For more than 20 years, Rabbi Ergus has held leadership roles across the spectrum of Jewish education, from Jewish camp to day school to JCCs and more. He has demonstrated his own personal passion for Hebrew, not only through his professional life and graduate work in Hebrew language and literature, but also in his personal life as past chair of the board of the Council for Hebrew Language and Culture in North America. Andrew? Ernie, thanks, uh, thanks so much. Thank you for your leadership and thank you for the lovely introductions. And of course, a big thank you to both uh, Shmuel and Gilad, <clears throat> who I first became familiar with uh, through your own work in my own learning, my own study and my own scholarship, and now very much enjoy being able to speak with you in, in person. Um, we're looking forward to a great conversation this evening, a wonderful sicha. While we'll primarily be in English, we know that there may be uh, questions or uh, opportunities to throw some Hebrew into the uh, batch as well. I do want to let everyone know that um, what we'll uh, be doing for the first period of time is uh, making certain that everyone, uh, that we have a little bit of a structured conver conversation uh, first with uh, Gilad and uh, Shmuel, and then we'll open up uh, the floor to everyone else uh, as well. So why don't we get started? Uh, Arnie gave us a little bit of an overview of your, uh, your background, but I'd love to hear you start and sh by sharing a little bit of your own language journeys and what led you to become a scholar of language and of Hebrew in particular. Shmuel, you want to uh, lead us off? Sure, of course. Um... I have a little confession, you know. I'm a language person, but I wasn't sure that this is what I wanted to be because my first uh, love was literature. And this is, by the way, thanks to my father. He was a very smart man. And when he saw me in the second grade in Israel, he saw me being really quite a reader. So he said, okay, now we'll put you, he was a very educated, he was, sim he was a poor man, but he was very well educated. He said, we're gonna go through a regime of, uh, of reading and the first three months, it's all in translation, of course, the first three months we're gonna do, let's say French literature in translation, the next three months, English literature, the next Russian, etc. And I read nonstop, just absolutely nonstop. Actually in sixth grade, when I began to be preoccupied in English, it was such a stupid thing at the time that they started English only at sixth grade, what a stupid thing to do. In any case, <laughs> now they're starting it at uh, fourth grade, right? And I guess, in any case, um, uh, I, I got to War and Peace, Milchama Shalom, and uh, I said, okay, that's enough for now. <laughs> no, but the truth is that uh, I, what I, did, I thought I was going to literature and I did not. The reason, you'll be surprised. It's uh, something very prosaic, but, but maybe my sensitivity. I've seen some of the work of the critics I'm sorry for mentioning names, but you take something like uh, Dan Miron, for example. 
Have you seen what he tried to do to Leah Goldberg? And others taking Leah Goldberg and Rachel and people like that, especially Leah Goldberg, and saying that they are so simplistic and no good and stuff like that. The, the literary critics are, could be so vitriolic. And uh, I, I felt that I don't like to do that. I think that if that's what expected of me, and I know that they're big on theory these days, etc., I don't want to do it. So I said, okay, I love language just as well. And uh, maybe I'll go into language and I'll really do a better job. Why? Because at least I would know that I'm not annoying anybody and nobody could fight with me on the data. I'm not gonna cheat on the data, you know? So there's language data and I analyze and, and I love language anyway. So that was my sort of middle ground. But I have to say that uh, my interest in language, when I look back, stand for my father's guidance. Because you see, I was amazed at, at the different styles and a different capturing of even periods, you know, in the literature that I read. I'll give you the best example that I think that I, I was so shocked by it. One of the things that he had me read was Till Olenspiegel. Now, Till Olenspiegel is a medieval piece, but it was later uh, uh, transformed by Charles de Coster, the Belgian, you know? And uh, he did a great job. And what did he do? He was so smart. He took medieval Hebrew when the language was not even spoken, okay? He took medieval, and he wrote it in pure medieval Hebrew, just like the Maskelim used pure biblical Hebrew, used medieval. And, and I, I, I was swimming through things like that. You know, my father came from Belarus actually, but there was a lot of uh, the Polish, the language, the culture was Polish. So I, I loved uh, as an adolescent, Sienkiewicz and you know, everything, it was amazing, you know? So I think that my interest in language actually started with uh, interest in uh, language in its historical period as expressed in the literary pieces coming. You know, this unbelievable things, uh, did you, you ever see the translation of Bialik of Don Quixote? Or Don Quixote, as they call it in Hebrew, it's amazing. These things are, you know, made me so fascinated by, by the, about the connection between literature and this. And now I'm doing a lot of work together with Tammy Sovran, and she's a literature person, and also a semanticist. So it's such a nice merger. That's it. <laughs> uh, shall, I, uh, shall I talk also about my main areas? Or well, let, let's, let's uh, we'll, we'll move into that. I mean. Gilad, is your journey uh, into language uh, similar, or did you take a, a, a slightly different path? Well, uh, firstly, I'm very happy to learn about uh, Shmuel's um, uh, journey. My journey is completely different uh, for two main reasons. The first reason is that I uh, knew I would be a linguist probably from the oral phase, if I uh, adopt uh, Freudian uh, phases of evolution of the baby. So I think that I had an inhibition in the oral phase. And when I, when I met my girlfriend from the Kita Aleph, which is the first grade uh, recently, she said, oh, I knew in Kita Aleph that you would be professor of linguistics. And I asked her, why? How did you know? And said, you always wrote palindromic stories you always wrote bilingual homophonous poems. So you were always ludic, playful with language from a very, from the age of seven, but I remember it even much earlier. At the age of four, I was um, kind of a mathematical um, prodigy, so to speak. And, and I, I did the Bagrut, you know, the diploma of Shalosh Echidot, three units when I was in Kita Aleph and stuff like that but I felt that mathematics had no heart. So maybe I was not good enough, you know, because um, I felt it was no, it was, you know, I was very good at it, but I, it, it, it lacked the humaneness, the humanity that, uh, that I, the menschlichkeit that I found in linguistics. So I think that uh, this is the, 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 the first thing, which is a, a little bit different from Shmuel, who, whom uh, I very much like and, and I like uh, his work. And as a student at Tel Aviv University, I already uh, read Shmuel's articles about uh, phonology and uh, of Israeli, what I call Israeli. The other difference is that um, I'm a very Pacific uh, person. However, when Shmuel said that uh, this vitriolic um, kind of existence that uh, you can see in Dan Miron doesn't, uh, I mean, it implied that it does not exist in, in Israeli linguistics. After I published this book in 2008, I received 
threatening yeah. threat letters. So like, I'm going to kill you. And, I, and also I, I've received vitriolic attacks from uh, various uh, linguists. Um, so uh, so in a way, I, I can tell Shmuel that linguistics, and you, you can see such of this, um, uh, sometimes you can see such phenomena also in, in, in Australia. I mean, nothing to do with me, but, uh, and uh, so this is, this is another difference. The third thing is that I, if, if, I, um, if I talk about literature, I think that I, unlike uh, Shmuel, I'm not that much into literature. And uh, in fact, linguistics is a way to be a professor without the need to read so many uh, novels and so many, you know, like Milchama Shalom, my war and peace. I mean, for me, it would be a hassle. It would be a pain to, uh, to, to go through all these. So I'm a linguist who is not into literature. And often people ask me questions which are actually related to style and to like, I mean, actually one, one such wonderful linguist is exactly Tammy Sovran, you know, she's, she looks at literature and uh, I, I'm not, I, I'm, a, I'm very much a linguist of the first uh, linguistic revolution and the first linguistic revolution as opposed to the second and the third uh, was the emergence of speech. And uh, as you know, Homo sapiens sapiens Israelicus vulgaris is characterized by the ability to speak, not by the ability to write, not by the ability to read. In fact, most languages in the world have no literature, have no script traditionally. And so more than 3,500 languages this, uh, we have 7,000 languages in the world alive and kicking, do not have a writing system traditionally, only by missionaries and uh, by, um, uh, you know, linguists. So it's not, it doesn't, so Hebrew, uh, the ancient Hebrew, the language of Isaiah, uh, as opposed to Israeli, is a very unique language in the sense that it has so much literature. So yeah, um, but I went to Tel Aviv University and I said, okay, maybe I'll be, I'll do something else, philosophy. Etc. But, you know, I always went back to linguistics and I could not help it. It's, it's my ikigai, you know, ikigai is a Japanese word for the intersection of four components, what you're good at, what the world needs, what you love and what you're paid for. And very few people arrive in their ikigai, most people like accountants, they're good at it, they're, they, they, uh, they're paid for it, the world needs it, but they don't love it. And guitarists, they're good at it, they love it, uh, they, um, the world needs it, but they're not paid for it. So to, to reach your ikigai is extremely um, rare. <laughs> I, uh, I think many people thought they were joining the Sikha, they'd learn some Hebrew and it looks like we're going to learn uh, many okay. other uh, language, or at least language references. Um, I, I want, uh, you know, I think we're, we're very lucky to have the two of you in this, uh, in this uh, conversation, helping us sort of unpack um, this language that uh, many call Hebrew, some call Israelit, uh, Israeli. Um, uh, but I, I'd love to go back to, you know, we, we began with a beautiful song uh, uh, written about, um, Eliezer Ben Yehuda, you know, certainly emerging from a, from a period of time where many <clears throat> uh, move towards sort of the great man theory of history. And I, you know, now that we're just a year away from uh, the hundredth uh, anniversary of his passing, I would love to hear your thoughts on uh, the, the, the construct of Eliezer Ben Yehuda as sort of the father of, uh, of modern Hebrew, uh, what elements of that should we be uh, celebrating? What elements of that might we need to begin to, you know, some correctives that then inform our conversation about where Hebrew is today? Uh, you want me to start? Oh, well. Um, it's a jump ball. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to the question of Israel, of Israel later, right? Sure. Okay. So, in terms of Eliezer Ben Yehuda, uh, there's no question about his being an exceptional pioneer. And the question is, uh, I think sometimes too much credit is given to him. And no, I mean, 
he deserves a lot of credit, especially with his, uh, you know, word formation, uh, you know, contributions a lot because of his huge dictionary project. And by the way, one of the interesting things about him is that he was, I think, the only one that argued, and most most other linguists did not, Hebrews did not uh, agree with him, that that Arabic roots could also be used if, in case we run out of roots in Hebrew, we could use Arabic roots. But people, some of the linguists uh, in Israel are pretty uh, nationalistic and they refused. So, uh, but maybe there's enough in Hebrew also anyway, regardless. In any case, I think that not enough credit is given to the teachers. Can you imagine these teachers who decided on their own to teach all the subjects, whether it's math, geography, history, literature, whatever, to do it all in a language that they never really used. So I think that teachers were an essential, absolutely essential part in the revival of Hebrew as a spoken language. And, uh, and I think that in addition to that, there were a lot of authors and poets and stuff like that, as you all, as you all know. I mean, it's, it's not um, an accident, by the way, that uh, the Hebrew Language Academy includes a lot of authors and poets because they are very productive in creating new words and stuff like that. And uh, of course, the Academy also, well, that's, uh, I'm sorry, that's about him. So anything else I want to say about him? Uh, no, I think that's that's about him. We'll get to the other subjects later. Bilad? Uh, I, I totally agree with uh, Shmuel about the role of teachers. I think that Eliezer Ben Yehuda was um, a monomaniac, uh, an obsessive, um, psychologically obsessive person, which is wonderful for a language revivalist. You must have crazy people. So in a way, had Ben Yehuda lived today, he might have been diagnosed, he might have got a disability um, kind of certificate from the university, um, uh, disability services or whatever. Um, <laughs> And uh, I like his work because of what Margaret Atwood uh, said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that has ever changed the world. And I think that Eliezer Ben Yehuda, along with the teachers, uh, that some of them he, um, he worked with, uh, they actually, made a revolution. What is interesting about um, Eliezer, there are two things, I think. One, he was not a linguist, he was a politician. So he was a political scientist. This is very important to remember. He understood that in order to have nationhood, you need three components, lang, land, and lens, cultural lens. Now, cultural lens or heritage we, we had. So my great, great, great grandfather, he happened to uh, come from Canaan because I found it in the DNA. But even if he were, if he was a Khazar who converted and became an Ashkenazi, it doesn't matter. He said, "Next year in Jerusalem, next year in Jerusalem, every Passover." Every... Uh, so the heritage was there. The land was the return to Israel, and then he understood that you need a third component for modern nationhood, and this is the language. So he was a politician. He was a political uh, scientist. So the other thing which is fascinating about him, he was a native speaker, of course, of Yiddish, of the Mameloshin, but just as most Zionists of the time, as a generalization, he despised the jargon because the jargon for him uh, represented the diasporic Jew who was feeble, feminine, homosexual, persecuted, um, weak, uh, religious. And uh, in fact, as you know, Elias Ben Yehuda had to go to prison because of the religious people who uh, alleged that he was desecrating the uh, holy language of, uh, of Isaiah. So I have a lot of respect uh, to uh, Elias Ben Yehuda. I think that he, he I, I actually, I, I give, Without him, I think it would have been harder. But of course, I uh, take Shmuel's point about the an incredible role of teachers. Yeah, I just want to add one sentence. Uh, first of all, he himself, you're right, was a politician, a very smart one. And there's no question about that article of his, Sheila Nikhbada, you know, that really changed the whole situation altogether. He was smart. You're right. He was a very clever politician. But in terms of the teachers, what they did was, and this is really very indicative. You see, he started to 
to put his son in a Hebrew, total Hebrew environment, everybody told him it's gonna make him crazy, you know, drive him crazy, made him, you know. So, <laughs> so uh, but the main thing were the teachers. And what happened was, which is fascinating, in the second decade of the 20th century, towards the end, there was a long, a big, big number of, of young adolescents who were actually native speakers of Hebrew. You know, and that's uh, and that's uh, a big achievement of the teachers. You you had mentioned uh, Shmuel, you I mentioned the the academy for the Hebrew language. Uh, um, you know, one of one of the early declarations of the new state was the establishment of this sort of an extension from Eliezer Ben Yehuda's committee. Um, you know, I I want to congratulate you on uh, recently being. Uh, made an honorary member of the academy, I'm, but I'm wondering when you when you move from the sort of the political sort of the academic, um, help us unpack what's a role of something like that play uh, today versus a hundred years ago when when uh, Eliezer Ben Yehuda was doing his work, or fifty years ago when the academy came came into being and there was such a need, you know, for this new language initiative. To be nurtured and and uh, midwif sort of an act of midwifery uh, to bring it into being does it does it still play a role today? Shall I start? Please. Okay. I, I just don't know if you noticed what Gilad put on this <laughs> Adloyada Adelaide Adloyada. That's very smart, Gilad. <laughs> Adloyada. You all know what Adloyada is, right? Adloyada well, Lavchin Ben. <laughs> but I, I should add, Shmuel, that uh, Adelaide is very famous for its wine. It's a, it's a wine city, so uh, there are many wineries here. And I, I should also visit. Add, I love wine. I have to come and visit you. <laughs> you have to come. There is especially good red. And the other thing is that uh, before living in Ad Adlayada, I lived in Brisbane, Brisbane Hapsorim. Brisbane <laughs> is Brisbane in uh, Queensland, Australia. So it's Genesis 15, Brisbane. In a way, I'm sorry for interrupting for just small thing. That's a small question. Uh, since you spend a good time in England, I'm, I'm finding it difficult as a linguist to identify your particular uh, accent in English because I heard Mata, Mata, like the British, like the Brits do. Do the Australians do that RLS dialect as well exactly or what? How, does, how do they behave in that respect? <laughs> it's funny because in Australia you have this R which is totally uh, totally gone. So for example, you go as a I'm from here, here. What is here? You know, here means like ER, it means here, here. What the Americans say, say here, here. So it's just like opening the so yeah, yeah they don't pronounce the R. It's uh so I my my own accent is a total mishmash, a total mishmash, as, as you can imagine, Israeli. Uh, British, American, Italian, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, nobody can pinpoint it. Okay, I'm sorry for the interruption. I, with regard to the academy, this is of course a crucial and a very important question in general. Now, look, I mean, I totally agree with Gilad that, and I hope all of you people participating are aware, and it's extremely important for anybody interested in language, I aware of the primacy of, of speech. I mean, writing always came later, you know? It was supposed to represent speech. Now, of course, speech keeps changing, evolving and changing. Writing tends to remain the same. And there's no question about it that, that uh, the essence of a language is the spoken language to start with. There's no question about it. I mean, you could argue, why didn't people start with sign language and they decided to, to use speech, that's a separate issue. But on the whole, speech is the primary, is the primary uh, element of language. This is why when it came to the revival of Hebrew as a spoken language, it was really, really interesting. I have to admit, I, I guess I would agree with Gilad there, that uh, most of these people were not really that interested. They wanted speech, of course, of course, but they were primarily interested in the sources. Look. You remember, first of all, let's look at the Maskilim, the Enlightenment period, you know? They insisted on writing in completely biblical style, you know, I mean, uh, using complete li biblical uh, vocabulary, 
which was really fascinating and, and was charming and stuff like that. But, but it was quite clear after a while that the Bible is a very limited corpus. It has something like something over 8,000 words. It's, it's, it's not enough. It's just not enough. So a big pioneer in this area was Mendeley. We all tend to think of Mendeley as Yiddish, but Mendeley was the first one who began to write while using all written sources. He established the principle that everything that was written in Hebrew is a possible source, okay? This is, you know, you could argue about the, use, the importance of this and, and, the, and the wisdom of this. For example, the question of medieval Hebrew, which as I say, I love because it's fascinating, I find it fascinating, but medieval Hebrew was a dead language for all intents and purposes. I mean, it was writ being written, but as spoken, it, it never was used as spoken language. So he said, no, everything in the sources is legit because we need, we need precedents, we need the vocabulary items on, with, upon which to build patterns and maybe even innovate patterns and stuff like that. So everything is legit. So this is the, the problem that we have is that we don't, look, I mean, I think Gilad probably would feel, I don't know if you, uh, Gilad, if you agree with Wexler, uh, Wexler's, uh, extreme, oh, you don't. <laughs> Wexler's extreme uh, position was that uh, when, and he was not the only one, there's a few historical linguists like him who felt that once there's a, a, a big break like that, in this case, over 1700 years in the spoken language after the Bakh uh, revolt and the, 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 the total exile, then uh, it's not the same language, you know? It's genetically, all I'm saying, all I want to say is that I think you should distinguish in situations like these between genetic, historical slash genetic development, and maybe those who are, who are really uh, fanatic about it would say that anything that's not, if there's no continued chain of speakers, you know, it's a different language. That's one approach. The other- I, I, I agree, yeah. You agree that it's not the same language? Yeah, I don't. But okay, let's let's get back back to it. That's that's the that's the crucial point here. This is why I'm I was anxious to talk about about Israelite, for example. Israelite. I'll get back to Israelite in a minute. Um, you see, the thing is that I'm I I was involved in a big lexical uh, project. I mean, I at the time I did something on on Hebrew verbs, and the last years, few years, I've been doing some stuff on nouns, and I came out with a dictionary of Hebrew nouns and adjectives, okay? It's not perfect, but it's, it's an achievement. Anyway, when I was approached about doing something similar to biblical Hebrew, and I have to say that I thought it would be a cinch, you know? It's not. The problem is that although in biblical Hebrew there's less than 5,000 nouns and adjectives, less, okay? It's so different from what we have today I have to check every word to see what it exactly means so I don't make a mistake. Not to mention, by the way, that I have a database that was based on Evan Shoshan 1970 with the uh, Sivan uh, supplement of uh, 1983. And with the 2003, they came out with an addition that discovered many mistakes. So I'm really at a loss. I'm, I'm in terrible trouble <laughs> because there's many things that were attributed wrongly, you know. Anyway, uh, what I'm going to say is the following, and this is where I, I'll come to the academy. Look, the academy, the most important, in my opinion, the most important goal that the academy had, especially when creating new terms and stuff like that, new words, because they were needed, you know? I'm not talking about syntax. The truth is I completely agree with both Wexler and Gilad that they didn't think much of syntax, you know? That's, that's a separate issue, but in terms of, of, of morphology, they were very, very anxious, you know, to create new words. But how do you create new words that they easily get accepted? Okay, how do they do that? They do it by trying to make everything as transparent as possible. Look, let me give a simple, very, very simple example. You know what I mean by, some of you know the history of Arabic maybe, about the nisba, the e, the default adjective, e. Like you take shulchan, shulchani, tzitz, no, tzitz, tzitz doesn't exist, but almost every Hebrew noun that you take, you can add an E and you get a default adjective uh, associated with it. Teva tivi. Sorry? Teva tivi. 
About what, sorry? Teva TV. Teva and TV. Uh, so sorry. I... TV. Oh, 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 oh. Teva oh. TV. <laughs> okay, let me, <laughs> well, in any case, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, 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 uh, Teva TV, by the way, that's what you're saying, right? In that case, uh, it's really interesting because um, you see, this is a segolate noun. And the question is, is a segolate creation always a linear? You know what I mean by linear? Linear versus discontinuous. Linear is we just attach, like in English, standard, standardized, large and large, wide, widen, you know, etc. You just add suffixes and prefixes. In Hebrew, it's not always the same. You, we do have this in Hebrew as well. In the case of E, that nisba, Arabic nisba E, that um, mostly under the influence of the Middle Ages, uh, that's, uh, that's linear. That's linear creation. Another one is on, on for diminutives, not all ons, but ons for diminutives. But the thing is with, uh, with something like TVE, you know, this, it's difficult to decide whether this is truly linear because you don't say TVE, but it's TV, TV, you know, it was the basis TV and you add E, you're right, uh, Ernie, you know, or Ernie. But, but in fact, it's not totally linear. It's with the intervention of an additional small process. What happened with the segolates? I'll, I'll try to make it. I'm sorry. Don't want to take too much time. The segolates, for instance, take something like uh, a kelev, okay? Uh, so, no, let's, okay, let's take kelev, okay? okay? So you have kelev and you have kalba, melech, malka, and say, etc. okay? So what about the segolites? The, the, the claim is that the Semites had a problem with final clusters. So they couldn't say, they couldn't really pronounce a final cluster. So they split it with a segol, kaleb or kalev. And then there was a uh, assimilation and it became kalev, you know? So the question is whether TV, it's teva, the ayin interferes because it changes the, the segol into an a and stuff like that. So the question is, if this is this truly linear? This is really a, a separate issue. Okay, but I'll come back to the main point. Let's take this yeah. thing about E, which is truly, truly linear. And this is when I come to, uh, where I come to the academy, it's it's fascinating when you look at the, at the academy and and the and the and the suffix e, which is a true suffix because you know sometimes they they fight about whether it's proper to call them prefixes and suffixes because some people claim that if you say michtav or mishkal or something like that that it's not really a prefix, okay? Because it's unlike a prefix in most European languages. So they have sometimes some people call it preformative, affirmative. I don't. I think it's confusing, you know. So let's say prefix, but doesn't matter. What, I, what I'm saying is that you add this E, okay? It almost did not exist in biblical Hebrew, okay? They had uh, directions on, I think, on its phony, and they had, like we said, Tishbi, etc. And j, 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 I mean, Knani, Gilad, all these kind of uh, uh, gentilic names, you know, Knani, Amaleki, etc. Okay, right? There are very few of them. Maybe ten at the most, or something like that. Okay, all right. It broadened a little bit in Middle Hebrew, but in in the medieval in Mishnaic Hebrew. But it got a real push only in medieval Hebrew for the simple reason that the influence Arabic was of Arabic was great. You know that all this thinking about linguistics came basically from the Arab grammarians. You know, Saadia Gaon, you know, drew a lot from contemporary uh, Arab grammarians. And uh, so the thing is, what do we do about this? Because you can claim, if you are extreme about this, you could claim that E did not really exist in biblical Hebrew and why bother? But they need it. Well, I, I, I just want to ask, and I, I'd love Gilad's, uh, um, we know that the academy plays a role in, you know, first of all, uh, the Academy is involved in organizing uh, an extraordinary uh, uh, Milon, you know, a, a dictionary of all historic uses of Hebrew, which seems like, uh, you know, there's, there's some content, con continuation there. And it's also trying to unpack and wrestle with these things. But I'm also wondering, you know, this is a conversation of academics. And I'm wondering, how does it kind of, What's the role of the academy actually for the people who are living that dynamic language? 
on a on a day to day basis, um, which which you had rep reference to as well. I think that the academy, any language academy, is crucially important within the process of reclamation of a Sleeping Beauty language. So in the case of Israeli, we are talking from 1880 until 1930. The moment the language is alive and kicking, which means the moment the language has 6.5 million native speakers as of, as of today, 6.5 million, well, almost 6.5 million native speakers, the academy is a waste of not only time, but also of tax money. So what I'm saying is that the Academy of the Hebrew language is based on an oxymoron, and the oxymoron can be found in the academy's website. The academy has three aims, and one of them is, and I quote, I remember it by heart, lechaven et itpatchuta shel asafa ivrit lefi tiva. I, by the way, tiva. Somebody mentioned teva tivi. Again, lechaven to direct et itpatchuta shel asafa ivrit the evolution of the Hebrew language lefi tiva according to its nature. Now. Any person, I think, you don't need to be a rocket scientist, should realize that there is an oxymoron here. How can you direct the evolution, the development of, a, of something according to its nature? If it's according to its nature, unless they mean Ivrit as opposed to Israelite, I mean, if they mean Hebrew as opposed to Israeli, I understand that. Then, of course, you direct it according to the nature of Hebrew, not according to the nature of Israeli. But if they mean the language of Israel, whether they call it Hebrew or Israel, then of course there is an oxymoron here. Now, uh, you've mentioned, Andrew, the, um, the, the Milon, the uh, historical dictionary. I personally believe that this is the only project which is worthwhile uh, by the Academy, but here there is a problem. I looked at the Milon uh, because I, I use it. It's a, it's a wonderful Milon. Often when you look at um, uh, glosses or when you look at etymologies, it is, there is a, an agenda. I'll give you an example. The word mishkafaim, uh, spectacles or glasses that, that we are all wearing. I think that all of us, including Arne even. Uh, so uh, this is a word that Chaim Leib Chazen coined in 1890, thinking of Greek Skopeo. I look at Skopeo is the great, great, great grandmother of uh, Mount Scopus. It is related to, spect to spectacles, actually, and to skeptical, uh, skeptic, skepticism, etc. So if I were to write the Milon, the dictionary, I would have said Mishkafaim, a phonosemantic matching, a hybrid word having two identical parents. One is Greek, Skopeo, and one is Hebrew. Now, if you look at how the Milon is written, they will say this is a Hebrew word 100%, and they might add influence by Skopeo as in, uh, you know, like whatever. So even, or Dibuv, you know, Dibuv is dubbing, uh, dubbing Dibuv, of course, it's a phonosemantic matching in the sense that it has two parents. One is English, dubbing, D-U-B-B, -B. one is uh, uh, Dibuv, which means speech, like Dovev Siftei Yashanim, yeah, in the Bible. The point in, in Song of Songs, I think, the point is that the Milon is written from the perspective of Hebrew as if Hebrew developed organically internally, but this was not the case because, and this leads me to uh, Shmuel's point about the genetic affiliation. So you see, the traditional view, the regnant, albeit pregnant view is that we speak Hebrew, the language of Isaiah and, and uh, you know, Israeli, what I call Israeli, is, is an organic evolution which was kind of influenced by many other languages like Yiddish. Like, then comes, this was the thesis. Then comes uh, Wexler and, he's, and he, he introduces the antithesis. Now, the antithesis preceded Wexler like Gottlob, uh, Gotthelf Bergstress. Uh, he talks about the language that he hears as a, as a European language with a transparent Hebrew disguise. Now, according to the antithesis, Israeli, is Yiddish with Hebrew words. So it is actually a, an Indo-European language. Both the thesis and the antithesis are monoparental. They believe that Israeli has only one parent, which in the case of the thesis is Hebrew, 
with influence, yeah. That, I mean, everybody believes that there was some influence. In the case of the antithesis, it's Yiddish with influence, of course. I come and say, Israeli is not monoparental. It does not have one parent. It has several parents at the same time. And this is why, when, it, when I said earlier that Elias Ben Yehuda hated Yiddish, of course he hated Yiddish, but he could not avoid his mother tongue, as well as all the teachers, as well as most of the revivalists, because don't forget, the revivalists, by and large, were Ashkenazic, Yiddish-speaking Jews. The influence of the Sephardim was minimal, minimal. There was a little bit of influence, of course, but it was minimal. So if you compare the influence of Ladino and the influence of Yiddish, it's like comparing, I mean, it's, it's impossible to compare. So Eliezer Ben Yehuda hated Yiddish, but he could not avoid it. And Israeli, at the end, is not Retzach Yiddish. It's not the, the murder of Yiddish. It's Yiddish Retzach. Yiddish speaks itself beneath Israeli. So if you want, Israeli is on the one hand Hebrew, on the other hand, Yiddish. And therefore, I do accept, of course, that a language that does not have native speakers for 1,750 years cannot be revived as it used to be. It's just impossible. And this is why Shmuel is right about biblical Hebrew being totally different. I mean, Shmuel mentioned 8,000 words, but actually 2,000 of them are hapax legomena, which means they only appear once. They are not really words that you can... Uh, you can build on and people kind of say, oh, what does this mean? Does this mean that? Hapak Segomena means only once in the entire Bible. So you have only 6,000 words. Israelis cannot understand the Bible. You know, an Israeli opens a Bible, say, oh, wow, it's written in Hebrew letters. There is Ekdach, there is Hashman. Actually, Israelis do not understand the Bible. I can give you thousands, hundreds of examples of how Israelis think they understand but they misunderstand without realizing it. Why do they not understand the Bible? Had Eliezer ben Yehuda been successful in reclaiming biblical Hebrew, it would have been a piece of cake. We would have avoided 2,500 years of evolution. The, the, the answer is that Israeli is not an organic evolution, but rather a hybridic revolution. So we revolutionize. The moment Israeli is alive and kicking, and this happens after the 1930s, no need for an academy of the Hebrew language that tells us whether we are allowed to say um, uh, no, you need to say like Ofra Chaza when she sings I think it's ridiculous because in Israeli you don't say this is the grammar of Israeli so why do we need to pay people to pay Moshe Barasher etc uh, to tell the native speaker how to speak. Let me just remind you that every president of the Academy of the Hebrew Language, every single president, maybe except Barasher, who is the current one, but I'm not sure about Barasher, was a non-Israeli native speaker, a non-native Israeli speaker. Do you understand? These people tell native speakers how to speak, even though they are not native speakers. I, I find it ridiculous, ludicrous. Shmuel, yeah. what's, uh, what's your... Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I have a lot to say, but... <coughs> what do you think of this and I of this idea that it's Israeli and not Hebrew? No, I'll, I'll talk about it uh, in a minute, but uh, I just want to make sure. Is the internet is there an internet problem? It's only from Gilad's side. Is there? No, no, we're all good. Difficulty? There was some problem? No. With the internet? I don't know. No? I'm sorry. So maybe it's my, my connection here. I shifted uh, to another company because, all right, anyway, uh, let's get to the main thing. Of course, in principle, I don't like language planning. I think it's a mistake on the whole language planning. Okay. And I think, by the way, that Gilad probably was, uh, uh, you know, was uh, taken by an Australian university, you know, because they wanted him to uh, save the aborigines from fate worse than death, language planning. <laughs> 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 but then, anyway, <laughs> maybe I'm exaggerating. No, there is the following. I, I'm sorry, I don't know. Something is wrong with the internet. Anyway, uh, what I want to say is this. You're right. It's possible that the role of the academy 
is sort of over at this point. But they did such an unbelievable work. Okay? Let's take even this example that I mentioned before about the E, you know, as an adjectival marker, okay? With very, very few precedents. They seized on this. They knew that there were very, very small amount, very small number of precedents. And they decided that the most important thing is to create new pattern that would be as, as transparent as possible so that everybody would understand it right away, okay? I'll take, uh, I'll take uh, maybe uh, one example that I think is characteristic of what's happening. But my point, what I want to prove, this is, is wrong. Moshe Barasher is trying to convince me all the time that the academy listens to speech listens to what the way people talk, etc. It's just that people are bombarding the academy. They decide, they want, don't, you, you're not aware maybe of the fact that they are asking guidance from uh, nonstop from the academy about everything, you know? And the fact is that it's the blame of the public. The public has this kind of a godless respect for the, ac for the but, academy. But Shmuel, Shmuel, but it isn't they, it academy because... and they think that they can tell them how yeah, uh, isn't it because the uh, Israeli public has been uh, is being brainwashed uh, by and indoctrinated by the academy as well as by the the Ministry of Education? So, for example, you have articles about the new words from the assembly line of the Academy of the Hebrew Language. You have Avshalom Ko who corrects uh, radio presenters, and when they make a mistake. Uh, or, or a mistake in quotation marks, he sends them uh, like a uh, rebuke. Et so it's kind of, it, it's, I, I think it might not be fair to say that it's the fault of the, um, of, of the hoi polloi, of the normies, because the normies are actually being indoctrinated to believe that if they don't understand the Bible, they should, they should they, their, their Hebrew is not good enough. You know, it's written in, and the normies, I mean, I remember when I was a child, I, I had to learn Asara, Asara Yeladim, Asara Eser Yeladot, etc., which is in total contradistinction with the grammar of Israeli. And the result is, is grammatical schizophrenia. You know, you don't know whether you say Shloshet Adodot or Shloshet Adodot. So the academy is actually part of the indoctrinators resulting in, as, and I agree with you, because I'm off, I often receive questions from nomis from hoi poloi, from masses. Do I need to say this or do I need to say that? Do I need to say yeshli hasefer or yeshli etasefer? You know, is Israeli a habere language or? So of course, I mean, the moment you 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 kind of it's a little bit like you put you uh, put fear in the in the citizens and then they they all want to uh, be protected. But at, in the first <coughs> instance, you're the one who uh, imbued this fear. I'd, I'd love to, at this point, open up the conversation to our Sicha uh, participants. If, uh, if you have a question, what I'd ask you to do is go ahead and put your question, put your question in the chat, and uh, I will call people. And when I call people, that uh, I'll also spotlight you, so, and then you can unmute and uh, ask your question. <coughs> Okay, can I continue? Please. Uh, okay, what I want basically to say is that, again, my feeling is that the academy is not trying to enforce its rules. Maybe the government misunderstands, I don't know what happens. The academy does not, is not interested in enforcing. I'll give you a very good example. Israelis had always had a problem with words like, uh, Shatil, okay, for a plant. And the academy was listening to this. And one day I get up and I found a new ruling that says that because of the difficulties inherent in this, you know, we're going to decide that Katil is, uh, is uh, a pattern for able type adjectives. You know, you know what I mean? Able type, like Shavir, Savir, Ragish, and oh no, Ragish, not. Uh, but you know what I mean, that's able type adjectives. And the ktil 
the still uh, pattern is for nouns, okay? So he said, now you can use still and still is, uh, still is uh, for nouns and we'll have to excuse some existing terms that have, are so ingrained that we're not gonna touch them. First of all, the fees seasons like katsir and batsir and stuff like that, you know, which are not able type, but they exist and yet did, all right? So, uh, so you see, by the way, and between us, I think that the idea of, of the people said shtil instead of shatil for plant before this decision, you know, came from just simple back formation. Just like from shlabim, you have, sh you have shlav in colloquial Hebrew and uh, instead of shlabim in the, in, the, uh, in the normativist view. So what happened is that this is, this is what's good about the academy and this is what's bad, okay? What's good is because they were making unbelievable efforts, you know, to identify patterns, even where there was very scant evidence in order to create new words in a productive way that would be as transparent as possible. They're very successful. And Katil, by the way, for able type adjectives, you know, is very, a very good example of that. However, the fault of this, and I, in this respect, I agree with Gilad, it shows also the weakness the trouble with planning. Why? Because people had already gotten used to tzamig for tire. So they tell them, no, now tzamig is viscose or viscose, how do you pronounce it? Viscose, viscose? Viscose, viscose. viscose. And, uh, and, and tzmig is tire. So all of a sudden people have to say tzmig for tire. And I'm, they don't say this, by the way. I think they say tire and that's it. So look, <laughs> they did the job that they were supposed to do. And maybe it could be that it's time for them you know, to finish, but they have in other roles and maybe there, sh there should be a shift, a shift from the, uh, uh, from the previous mode into a, a mode that does, you know, documenting like the historical dictionary and stuff like that. Now, let me, let me, let me tell you this. What Gilad said about Mishkafayim and stuff like that is not totally accurate because if you look at Evan Shoshan, you know, he, he has everything, all the etymological information that you want, including the current, the previous, and it gives you example for different periods of time in history when it was, okay? So in this respect, okay, the work that they are doing is important. Okay, good. In this respect, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a word that's continuing and it should continue. And maybe it is time, maybe it is time. I don't think it's a waste by the way, because they are still doing tremendous work in creating new words based on, on, on transparent patterns. And maybe they feel that it's needed, somebody needs to put some order into this. And, uh, and the truth is that, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 we can Does see- uh, the time time? Time? Does it Does mention the Greek, or the, Greek, uh, the Greek root or not? I can't see for, for sure, I don't know. No, they don't have the Greek. Uh, they, they need to read um, my 2003 book, Language, Contact, and Lexical Enrichment in Israeli Hebrew. They don't have it. Okay. Look, in any case, the Academy should be getting great credit for the work it did in the past. How it should continue in the future, I'm not really sure. But I think that in this whole discussion, you know, there's one thing that is missing if I have a few, another three minutes or something like that. In this whole discussion, what I'm miss, miss, missing is the distinction, I mean, the register differences. Look, we are talking basically about different registers. As it stands, the academy embodies sort of, if you like, the highest, most formal register of the language, okay? You could say against the language of the street, whatever you want to call it, against the colloquial, all right? And, uh, we have to always remember that there are separate levels of usage, okay? And there is a colloquial, there's, there's the higher levels, and even between them, there's all kinds of intermediate, middle, whatever you want to call it, okay? And the, the thing is that none of these is wrong. You cannot say, and I don't think the academy is saying either, by the way, you cannot say that uh, uh, slang, for example, is, uh, is wrong. Slang is its own grammar, it's on structure, it's on everything, even metaphors, you know. Slang is unbelievably creative and uh, usually it preserves the norms of the language, okay? Okay, let's take, so what do I mean by register? 
I'll give you a few simple examples. First of all, I don't know if you know this, but most people, including educated ones, and this is a, a touchy one, say hazoti instead of hazot. Hazoti, because they regard it as an adjective, so they add the E, okay? So I tell people, there's certain criteria that should make for yourself. For example, let's decide. We have to make this decision. If everybody with at least high school education, all right, agrees that Azoti is okay, then this is normal colloquial Hebrew. Of course, at the highest level, at the highest uh, formal level, it's not, uh, it's not appropriate, okay? Azoti is not. In other words, what I'm saying is if you write a, a request for a, for a job, you know, and you write Azoti, you, the letter will be thrown out, you know? You don't do that in formal situations, okay? It's just part of the colloquial. You know what? Let me take some few minute examples and then take a major one about the numerals, which is important. Look, even if you look at the description of this meeting, okay, there were two things that were not, definitely not acceptable at the highest level. One is of course uh, English and it's Andrew's mistake if he wrote it, okay? And it's uh, fen, uh, explore this phenomena. I don't know if you made a mistake here, Andrew, or you didn't know. Some people don't even know that the word is phenomenon. Yeah. So in the highest level uh, of usage in English, okay, you cannot use phenomena for the singular, okay? But many people do use it. So it's a question of decision. If let's say that most native speakers of Hebrew and of English use phenomena is a singular, just like there's a confused, same confusion with data and datum and stuff like that, you know, then it's acceptable. Now let's take uh, the famous, uh, uh, the famous term Israelite, okay? It's not normative, Gilad, and you're aware of it, right? Are you aware of it? I don't agree with the term. I'll tell you why in a minute. It's not normative, why? You tell me, Gilad. Oh, uh, Israelite is not normative because according to the Hebrew grammar, it should be pronounced Israelite with a re, Israelite. But no, no, Israelite you're talking about the re. You're talking about the re? Not no, about that. That's about the not... shwa. The shwa. The shwa, exactly. Okay. But, but of course, be... Israelite okay. is according so to the Israeli grammar. 9.9% you would say Israelite. Israelite, okay? Yeah. Okay. Israelite is the normative. So I'm talking about norms. What's acceptable at the highest level, okay? And what's acceptable in middle Hebrew and what's acceptable at the lower levels, okay? Especially in the colloquial. And it's important to make this kind of distinction. Now, since you mentioned the question, the matter of the, uh, of, uh, of the numerals, this is a, has been a very hurtful uh, thing for me for many, many years, because I predicted maybe 30 years ago, I guess, that the distinction will disappear. It's a stupid distinction. But it's so ingrained in Semitic languages. Are you aware? Are you people aware of what happened here? Let me briefly. Do you have a minute or two to, to uh, specify, Andrew? If, uh, if you can give the, the, the shortest version, I think that'll be helpful. We have a, a one or two questions that people would like to ask. Of course. OK. So basically, what happened in Semitic, and I, not just in Semitic, actually, all the feminine endings okay, of ah and similar stuff, okay, did not stand for gender to start with. The adding of ah to a stem referred either to non-human or to small, okay? The one without ah was human or something <coughs> big, and, and the, the one with ah was small. So for example, let me give you an example or two, just one second. Uh, okay, uh, there is, oops, oh shoot, just dropped my tequila. <laughs> hey. uh, tequila meaning the non, meaning a small tequila. <laughs> <laughs> I end with the, I, I didn't have a, an open uh, um, bottle of wine. I would have taken wine. So I took tequila because I didn't have wine. Okay, so let's take oni, oniya. Okay, okay, oni 
is the big, Oniya is a unit, okay? Then uh, general for small things, you have Chita because it's small, Te'ena because it's small, okay? You have uh, Yarech, thigh, and Yarcha or Yerecha, which is uh, a, a side, you know? A thigh, Yarech is thigh, and the side, from that it extends to, to the side. Okay, and then uh, Malon Meluna. Meluna is also a kind of a small Malon, okay? Not necessarily for dogs, by the way. It's for, if you work in the field, you know, you have a Meluna. And Chelek, uh, Chelka, and so on. Now, they, there's also, uh, Segal also mentioned Dag versus Daga. Dag is fish, Daga is small fish. Etz is wood tree. Etza is small trees. And Cheres, Chalsa. Chalsa is, Chalsit, sorry. Chalsit is fraction of, of, uh, of clay, okay? Or clay matter. So basically what happened in, in Proto-Semitic was a very strange phenomenon because you see, anybody here knows Arabic? You know that in Arabic, the plural, okay? The plural uh, is, a, the plural of, of objects is feminine, singular, feminine singular, okay? It's still today, to this day in Arabic, all right? So it's identified by the same old Semitic, uh, it's a remnant from that old period. So what happened was that since, let's say, take soldiers, okay? Soldiers were considered an army. Army was a kind of a, like a big mess, okay? But it was still non-human as a mess, okay? So they decided to give it an ah. And then the masculine, because gender had priority over number, okay? So they they put the, uh, they put the, uh, uh, <laughs> they put the feminine for the plural of the masculine, you see? Feminine ending, I mean, all right? You follow me more or less? That's what, according to Robert Hetzron, this is what happened historically. He's a well-known, uh, was a well-known uh, linguist. So the thing is that later they began, began to follow the actual gender, you know, the way I understand it today. But this, it started differently. Now, numerals, for numerals, this is stupid. It's absolutely stupid. Look, Echad, we know about Echad. Shnaim is dual, so one and two, don't belong in the numerals even, you know? But from three on, there's no reason in the world for masculine and feminine in the numerals. It's ridiculous. You follow me? So the thing is, the thing is, people definitely decide, and this is a very smart decision, they decide on only one set, okay? Uh, this is the fascinating thing. <laughs> I'll try to do it quickly. In Hebrew, they decide on the suffix less, I wouldn't say feminine, Suffixless. It's a, the whole point is it's a suffix. It's not feminine at all. It has nothing to do with with uh, with uh, suffixes. Okay. So so uh, with. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. So what happens is that uh, in when in counting, okay, when the word is in isolation, or when you say number such and such, like bus number five, okay. Autobus mispar chamesh. They always use the, the, the suffix less, the suffix less form, okay? So, listen to this. Chach, time, shah, listen to me carefully. Chach, time, shah, lo, sharba, chamesh, she, sheba, shmone, teisha, esef, papa, 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 papa. Of course, there's gaps. But on the whole, it's a trochaic rhythm. And this is how children, this is my hypothesis, this is how children learn it, you know, from the way they hear, they begin to, to learn the language. They hear the whole paradigm. Now listen to Arab. Uh, yeah, if, you, if they said, echad, shnaim, shlosha, arba'a, chamisha, shisha, it's, it's, it's stupid, it's, it's anapest. It doesn't flow. The, you look, the dactylic, the trochaic, the, the trochaic rhythm, that's the most natural rhythm. Now we take Arabic, I mean, wow, everything okay? I don't, don't see anything. Shmuel, I, I, I think you're okay, but I, I, I also want to be sensitive to the time that we, that we have yeah, left. Okay, okay. Let, me just, so let me just finish the point. Yeah. The point is that in Arabic, it's, it's one, it, the one is uh, the same thing. So look, Hebrew chooses the, uh, the All right, so I think it's time for the academy to recognize that the gender distinction in, 
in uh, numerals is totally irrelevant for uh, for the colloquial. That's all. I'd love to ask uh, one last question, which takes us all the way back to uh, the role of Sicha, and that is the conversation about uh, Hebrew and the Jewish experience. Um, I, I, I'm interested both, uh, you know, from the work that we do here at Hebrew the Center, as well as sort of your own lives, uh, which have been lived as Hebrew speakers, um, at, at least professionally, outside of Israel. Um, what are we, you know, for those of us who are looking to connect with Hebrew, um, beyond uh, Israelite, or connected to Israelite, um, what's kind of, how, how do we think about this idea of the academy, of how the language is dynamic and evolving, but primarily um, in, in, in the modern state of Israel? And what does that say to us? Kind of what's the role of the Jewish community and its connection to this evolving language, especially if we're to only consider Hebrew to be sort of the historic written text of the classic, uh, you know, the uh, Aron Sfarim. I think that uh, the first thing that uh, the Jewish community and the American uh, Hebrew teachers uh, should do is to um, consider making a very obvious, a very clear, a very um, unambiguous distinction between learning the language of the Bible or the Mishnah and uh, learning the language of uh, modern days Israel. You must have this distinction between the two, otherwise you are wishy-washy, you're kind of uh, uh, resulting in people who go to Israel and being laughed at because they speak Ulpanit or they speak, you know, I, I, I had a German girlfriend uh, once and uh, she used to speak like Amiti, Amiti Lakita, you know, Amiti. Nobody says in Israel Amiti like that. Maybe if you write a letter of reference or whatever, as some, some of the people here mentioned, as opposed to the Silicon Valley, which they don't care. I mean, you go to um, computer high tech companies in Israel, they speak totally against all the rules of the Academy of the Hebrew language, etc. So the first thing I think is to make a clear distinction to teach uh, Hebrew absolutely. Uh, Hebrew is an important language for Jewish people um, and to teach it as a foreign language, both in Israel and, and, and in America. And to have a teacher of Israeli uh, who might be um, a person who learned applied linguistics and maybe somebody who is a native speaker from Israel. And also um, you will have a, um, a teacher of Hebrew who also learned applied linguistics. And in this case, obviously, needless to say, uh, Israelis have no uh, advantage. On the contrary, they have a disadvantage. So uh, when it comes to, for example, teachers of Hebrew as opposed to teachers of Israeli, uh, teachers of Hebrew as a generalization, I would go for the non-Israeli. I mean, of course, I'm not saying that an Israeli cannot be, uh, but if I have the choice. So this is a very important distinction. The other thing I wanted to, um, to say uh, is about two questions that I saw in the, uh, in, the, in the chat. The first question was comparing Israeli to uh, English. So for example, Chaucer is totally misunderstood by Shakespeare, which is totally misunderstood by uh, say, um, uh, B Joe Biden, you know, so Joe Biden, when he reads Chaucer, he would not understand anything. This is an organic evolution of a language. It's very uh, common, a language after 1000, after 2000, after 50,000 years cannot be understood, uh, even though it was an organic evolution. The case of Israeli is totally different and cannot be compared. So whoever brings the example of English or, or Greek that of course is unfathomable to the modern Greeks, it's totally irrelevant because as I said earlier, if you reclaim a language as it used to be, this evolution would have been avoided. But we see that in, his, his, in Israeli, it was not avoided. The other thing is about, somebody asked about the gender language. The gender language, so you, nowadays you, have, you don't ha have only boys and girls, you have uh, non-specific, you have, 
LBGTQI, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I have seen some uh, people already speaking like that. Ani ochele vekoteve. You know, so it's in between a male, a feminine, and a masculine. Now, I, as a linguist, am a, des a descriptivist. So I describe language as it is. So I don't think it's the role of the Academy of the Hebrew Language to tell us whether it's allowed to say rosha, like roshata memshala, roshata, roshata ir. It's, it has nothing to do with the Academy of the Hebrew Language. I mean, if we have more and more trans, uh, trans whatever, or, or non-specific genders, if we have more and more non-specific gendered people who are very influential within society, within the young people, we might end up with ochele uh, and koteve, which is in between a mother. But it's not, it's, not, it's not for me to say. I receive every week, should I say ochele? Should I? I'm a linguist. I'm not, I mean, it's kind, of, it's kind of weird to see linguists who decide for speakers how to speak. And I'm happy to hear Shmuel, Shmuel's thoughts about the uh, numeral disagreement uh, in uh, uh, which is kind of the Academy of the Hebrew Language no-no. The Academy of the Hebrew Language, it, it does anything that the, um, that the native speaker says uh, against the Academy of the Hebrew Language rules, so the Academy kind of changes. It's a little bit like uh, Simpson, I think it was Bart who uh, showed how the dog, how he trains a dog and the dog went and sniffed the ass of all the, the, of all the other dogs. And, and Bart just changed his instructions. Go dog, go sniff the, the butts of the other dog. You know, so as if, as if, as if the dog follows his uh, regulations, his uh, instructions. Of course, it, it is not the case. But in the case of the numeral disagreement, the academy actually is very much against Esser Shekel, very much against Shloss Reladim, Shloss Reladot. And I'm happy to see Shmuel, as you've mentioned, uh, Andrew, because uh, I understand that he's now a member or, or an associate member or an affiliate member of the Academy of the Hebrew Language. So maybe we will see the Academy of the Hebrew Language practically um, uh, evaporating, at least when it comes to uh, telling people how to speak. Well, any uh, last thoughts on how do uh, individuals who are living, living in North America and elsewhere, but outside of Israel can feel connected uh, to the language, uh, you know, as it evolves both uh, in the street and the academy. Uh, I, um, I think that all of us, see, maybe I should start, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying not to take too long, but I think that, I think that many people, let's say in the States, okay, feel upset about the use of the word Israeli instead of Hebrew. The reason is that, first of all, if you take a look, I, I wrote a review of Wexler, you know, of Wexler's book at the time. And my whole argument was that although genetically, okay, genetically, it was discontinued for 1700 years, but typologically it is a Semitic language, okay? And some people are very upset at the use of the term Israeli, Israeli to replace Hebrew because they feel that it is Hebrew and it's definitely Hebrew. Look, if you look at, as I showed in that article on, on Wexler, if you, sh if you show the place of contact between uh, biblical Hebrew, uh, Mishnaic Hebrew, medieval and modern, you will see that it makes sense. It's a continuous that it's a continuum that makes sense. I'll give you a simple example. Take the question of you know in biblical Hebrew. I'm, I don't know if everybody knows. Biblical Hebrew does not have a tense system. It has an aspect system. There's there's um, perfect and imperfect basically. Okay. And the thing is that this began to change in Mishnaic. It was not a total change, but it was a change because there was let's say something like perfect and. Then there was the future and, pre and, and present together, more or less. Basically, I wouldn't go into details, all right? So the change into past, present, and future as we have it in Israeli Hebrew is a natural thing that happened anyway. Many of these things are natural things that happen, okay? Now let's take just very, I'll try to make it quick. All the different components, look, take 
take a phonology, pronunciation, whatever, okay? When you have phonology, okay, the phonology of all languages change. They change drastically, okay? And some of the things that took place uh, in Hebrew, in modern Hebrew, it's not just because of the Ashkenazi pronunciation and stuff like that. It's because some of them you can even find in the other world, you know, happening in Arabic, for example, and it, as it develops, because languages develop, the simplifications, syntax, even syntax changes, okay? Look, some people say, okay, you have in the biblical Hebrew, you have Sifri and Beiti and so on. In modern Hebrew, it says, Sefer Shili, Abayt Shili. In Arabic, they say, Al Kitab Tabai, you know, they break it also, okay? These are natural tendencies that happen in languages. And I think that if you take all the connecting points between biblical, Mishnaic, and uh, medieval, and come to, to modern Hebrew, okay, there's no reason to, to, to take away from people the right to call it Hebrew because this is their language. They are committed to it ideologically and it's important for them. And Hebrew is the language and I want to just finish with this. Hebrew is not the language of Israel. It's the language of all the Jewish people. And the duty of every Israeli is to do whatever they can, and every Jew here, you know, to promote the use of the language. Because this is, well, as, as Gilad was saying in the beginning, this is an important component of the whole revival. And, uh, 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 and in this respect, it's unavoidable. So we should all make an effort to promote Hebrew. And I think it will happen. It will take a time, a while, and it will happen. By the way, even in the synagogues, I think in the States, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of them are adopting a, a normal Israeli pronunciation, you know? So there's all kinds of movements that are, and I think that, that Gilad, I don't, don't get angry at me, but I don't think you have the right to try to deprive the people of the use of the term Hebrew, just because you want to make a distinction. You may be right in principle, but it's wrong in other ways. Sorry. Well, I mean, as a, as a descriptivist, uh, if, if, if Israelis would like to call uh, the Israeli language Gruzinit, which is uh, Georgian, or if they want to call it Albanit, I am the last person to uh, tell them how they should call it. But as a scientist, for example, who tells me that koala is a bear, uh, you know, like if, if you write as a zoologist a, a book and you say the bearedom the bear, the birdom of koalas, then of course I would be very surprised if I'm a zoologist. Of course, when I give a koala to my niece in Israel, I I tell her in a dove koala bishvilech. Yeah, but of course I know it's not a dove, it's not a bear. But so the point is that, uh, and and probably I should share with you something very funny. Uh, when when I when I published this book, uh, they they wrote down zeusifuarishon. Be'ivrit. Can you see this one? Uh, and here it's written Israelite. So I actually told them it's impo It's a non sequitur. It's impossible. And then they told me, we give you an ultimatum. Either we'll leave it Be'ivrit. This is his first book in Hebrew. Or we change it to Be'israelit acharon Be'amoved. You know, that's, the last, <laughs> that, that's his first book in Israeli and his last book in Amoved. Now, what happened was they changed it, except that recently there is a second edition and they went back to I was shocked. So actually, if you buy today, it's, it says so I don't know exactly what's happening there, maybe a conspiratorial, but this is Amoved, you know, they, changed, they went back. I think that uh, a name is in the hands of the speaker the speaker can re i mean if you want to call it whatever you want you but when i write about it and if i believe that it's a hybridic revolution rather than organic evolution i must uh think about the name as reflecting the uh the nature don't forget that uh there was a guy called confucius and when the bible was written 2500 years ago when it was codified uh, he wrote uh, the Analects, and he said, Pia Zhang Ming Hu. The first thing one has to do is to rectify names, to rectify names. I think that he talked about politicians mostly. Politicians are very good at it. But I think that scientists, or in this case, linguists, I don't know how scientific we are, but you know, I consider my, myself a social scientist. We need to rectify names. And if the name is misleading, then you know, I'm, probably the last sentence I will say that I was sitting 
in a, in a cafe in Tel Aviv and I asked the waitress, למה קוראים לזה סלט יווני? Why, why do you call it Greek salad? To which she replied, אתה לא רואה שיש בזה גבינה בולגרית? Don't you see that it has a Bulgarian, Bulgarian cheese in it? So, you know, Israelis are very, uh, very bad with names and why, you know, if there is an Israeli who would like to uh, kind of uh, uh, give them a little bit of insight about the origins, why not? I mean, they can continue to call it Ivrit, Ivrit Israelit, Ivrit Modernit, uh, you know, whatever, Gruzinit, I, I don't care. I understand. Elad, my friend, Elad this Shmuel. This one's well, like, Elad, uh, I think we could I have to continue finish. this uh, lovely uh, discussion. Typologically, uh, typologically, your Israelite is Hebrew, typologically. Maybe genetically you don't agree, but typologically it is Hebrew. That's all. <laughs> we look forward to seeing this, uh, this discourse continue. I, uh, I'm going to thank you both uh, for sharing so much of your knowledge and a level of, of detail and insight uh, into this topic that is really, uh, really extraordinary. And I'll turn it back to uh, my partner, uh, Arnie. I, I, all I can say is that I think Eliezer Ben Yehuda should actually be celebrating that there is so much dialogue, so much richness, so much generative discussion around a language which uh, he's dedicated so much of his life to. And, and I, um, I, I really um, enjoy, I hope everybody appreciates the controversy actually and how dynamic Hebrew is. And, and um, Shmuel, I, I thank you for um, uh, encouraging all of us to make sure that Hebrew be, is a language in whatever form will belong to all of us and to the Jewish people. Uh, I uh, want to thank Gilad, Shmuel, Andrew, all of you who are here. I, I, um, I want to also acknowledge the shout out to teachers and their role in the revival of Hebrew this has been a year that we should shout out and appreciate all the educators who are with us, who are out there um, and, and everything you have done to continue to keep us engaged. I look forward to seeing many of you as we have some exciting other topics coming up uh, and uh, including that uh, uh, the crisis of the Hebrew language on the college campus. Um, and uh, we uh, keep an eye out for the dates, the future dates that will be coming your way. And thank you, Rab Todot, We really appreciate your being with us. Thank you all. And that, that brings this evening's Sicha to a close. Thank you, Shmuel. Thank you, Gilad. Thank you, Arnie. Yeah. Yeah, thank you all. Oh, by the way, one last comment. Sicha in uh, the higher register means a lube, jo a lube, a lube of a car, you know. <laughs> Don't forget that. <laughs>